to take me to dinner tonight? Uh, uh, no, I remember. I'll be wearing red, the color of passion. Uh, I'll, I'll stick with green, uh, the color of envy. Envy? Uh, well, I'm envious of anyone not having dinner with you. What? Uh, well, I mean that, uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, uh, here she is, uh, Zelda Rose and her singing owl. Well, it told me a thing when the leaders... Oh, hi. Um, okay, so... We are starting on interspecific competition today, which is lecture number eight. It's going to be a fun time, guys. I hope you're excited. Okay, so first of all, interspecific means between individuals of different species. So if intra was same species, inter is different species. Just like intraspecific was more intense because everything overlapped, Interspecific is less intense because they don't overlap on all the things that they could com potentially compete for. Also, the effects are often asymmetric, which, me which means one individual is more affected by the interspecific competition than the other individual is. Interspecific competition also influences population regulation and it affects the distribution of organisms or it affects the boundaries of the realized niche. So, ho -ho. Um, individuals can evolve to deal with the pressures of interspecific competition. So if one kind of organism likes to eat another, if one, one can evolve because if they camouflage, then they won't get eaten. And that's a convenient way for a uh, that to work for them. The effects of interspecific competition are reduced by environmental heterogeneity, niche partitioning, and character displacement, which means if a species evolves, then compared to its less evolved ancestor, it will participate in less interspecific competition than its older, less evolved. So if you evolve, that gives you a better chance of staying away from this other organism that you're um, competing with. And that's why um, effects like those can reduce interspecific competition. Okay, so an example of interspecific competition is these nice cute little barnacles called like chattel malice or something. And so there are a couple different dimensions that... Uh, determine their competition, which is predation, competition, and environment 
they all influence their realized niche. Um, and what we learned from this is that interspecific competition can control habitat boundaries. So we see that the light colored barnacles are found in the upper tidal zone. In the middle, middle tidal, middle, <laughs> sorry, middle tidal zone, you can find both. And then in the lower tidal zone, you can only find the darker. You can see at the borders where one starts to creep into the other's territory. But, um, so we see in the very top that too much drying of the upper limit of the habitat uh, limits where these things can live. Um, and then the lower limit is controlled by the other species. So the white can only live in the upper tidal zone between where it's too dry and then and then uh, their bottom border is where the darker barnacle is. So the presence of competition pressure is the lower limit of their realized niche. And then the, uh, the lower limit of the darker barnacle is predation by starfish, because if, if they go too low, starfish will eat them. Likewise, their upper limit is competition with the lighter colored. So where those two meet, it's the top border for one and the bottom border for another. Okay, so then we have nice bacteria. So when you grow these two different types of bacteria together, then one will die out or become almost extinct, and one will do better. This also shows how this is an asymmetric relationship because one does really well and one does, well, dies pretty much. Um, if you grow them separately, then their growth rate is about the same, which you can see on the top graph. But then if you grow them together in a mixed culture, one will die and one will live. So, you can also see that in the bottom one, the one that survived still had a uh, logistic pattern like they did when they grew separately, but it was not as high a density because the other, and then the, uh, because the other one was there, but then the other one became extinct. So that shows us how interspecific competition can be seen even in petri dishes. Fascinating. Okay. So the concept of limiting similarity. So if um, if two organisms are similar in some way, then they limit each other's density or niche or abilities. So the more similar two organisms are, the more limiting they are in each other. So just like we don't compete with dogs as well as we compete with each other. So to eliminate this overlap of being similar, they diverge. So they, you know, they switch up their food preference. Like in, in graph A, most prefer a medium food size. Then in B, where two organisms overlap, um, they overlap on food size preference. So they only overlap in that little triangle in the middle. And then over time, C could happen, where A and B have been competing, competing so they excluded each other uh, due to that limiting similarity. And that, that, that's what could happen over time, and that's evidence of competition, because um, they're too similar to coexist. Um, in graph E, it's the same thing, but now there's three species, so eventually they get... Um, farther apart. Okay, so competitive exclusion occurs as a result of limiting similarity. So if resource requirements between individuals are too similar, then competitive exclusion results. So if they feed on the same thing, one will have to exclude the other from eating that thing. Okay. And that'll result in either one switching up its range or becoming extinct. Okay, reducing interspecific competition. There's a couple ways to do that. Um, assuming that a pair of species in competition manages to coexist over a long period of time, the competitive pressure can be reduced by evolutionary mechanisms. So they can evolve. 
Evolving is one way to reduce interspecific competition. Um, they could use different parts of the environment, um, only if there are enough different niches in an environment to go around. Um, so they can use environmental heterogeneity, which is finding a different niche to take up. Uh, niche partitioning along various dimensions, so there could be temporal partitioning, like you have with owls and hawks, where one will hunt at night and one hunts during the day. Uh, spatial partitioning, so you just go to a different space. Um, and character displacement, where you evolve as a result of competition. So character displacement, again, is an evolutionary change in physical characteristics. Okay, this next graph shows um, the larger area of New Guinea and the smaller Solomon Islands. So you can see in New Guinea on the left that there are three different realized niches for three different species of birds. But on the right, there's only one bird that's survived. Only one can live there. Because the island is smaller, it's too small for all the species to exist. So one of the smaller, even though it was one of the smaller niche, niches on New Guinea, it has escaped competition on the Solomon Islands, and it pretty much has a monopoly on that island. So, so, so. That's another example on how this actually happens. So environmental heterogeneity is finding a niche that no one else has. So utilization of unpredictable gaps or empty niches in the environment. Oh look, there's a tree that has no one in it and someone needs to live there. I'll take it up. That's environmental heterogeneity. So tropical forest gaps, which is where the trees fall down, is a good example. It provides plentiful sunlight for species that would otherwise be unable to take root and grow. Uh, the utilization of refugia within the environment to eke out an existence in the face of competition. So if you find a refuge within the environment, you can use that and not let anyone else in, and then you can uh, eke out that other piece of competition. So like we said, niche part temporal niche partitioning um, would be a hawk hunting during the day and an owl hunting at night, because they pretty much eat the same things. So they have to temporally partition. Uh, spatially partitioning is like the black-capped black chickadee, where they live in this well-covered map of Pennsylvania, and then the Carolina chickadee only lives in these parts of Pennsylvania. So each chickadee prevents the other from entering its portion of the state, because it's using all the resources there. So they do overlap a little, um, and where they overlap, they actually produce fertile hybrids. Another way to spatially partition would be height in trees, which we can see on this graph, where different kinds of tanagers feed at different heights of a tree. And by doing that, they can avoid each other and avoid interspecific competition. It's like magic. These animals are so smart. So again, we have character displacement as a result of interspecific competition. So evidence for character displacement in beak size and populations of the Galapagos finches, which is what Darwin was working on. Hey, Mr. Baseman, you got that certain something. Hey, Mr. Baseman, you set that music thumping. Do you it's easy when you go one, two, three, ba 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 ba. You mean ba 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 ba. Yeah, hey, Mr. Baseman, you're on all the songs with a ba 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 boom boom and a ba 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 boom boom ba ba. Hey, Mr. Baseman, you're the hidden king of rock and roll. Ba 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 ba. No, no, ba 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 ba. Oh. Yeah, the way you sing, cause Mr. Baseman, I wanna be a baseman too. Ba 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 ba. Like this. Now you. With me. Well, I 